Well, good morning, Spring Lake Church. It's great to see all of you this morning. A special welcome to those who are joining online as well. Um, so the church has been doing a lot of different things. You can see Kids Camp was amazing this week, but uh, we also had something else recently that happened. We had a Peru missions team um, that just arrived back in the United States uh, just two weeks ago. And uh, so I want to share a little bit of an update about that. Um, I was on that trip. We had five students and three adults on that trip. And uh, first, before I share my little story, I just want to say there's some amazing students at Spring Lake Church. I got to witness five students from our church uh, go into the jungles of Peru and share their testimonies with the gospel included and tell little kids in the jungles of Peru about who Jesus is and why Jesus matters. And so that was a really cool experience in, of, in and of itself. Uh, but I also uh, had an experience where I got to um, we were going to these different schools every day, and we're connecting with these kids in Peru. And uh, one of the days, on the Thursday that we were there, uh, they said, uh, we're going to send the students from the United States over here to this school, and Pastor Ryan and the other leader, and Pastor Bill, you're going to come with us, and we're going to go to a church plant. I was like, awesome, this is really cool. And so we're in the middle of the jungle. We walk into this guy's house. His name is Miguel, and he wants to have his very first church planting service, his very first church planting service. And so uh, Miguel gets up and he says, you know, I invited all of my neighbors. I invited all of my friends. I invited everyone around, and not a lot of people wanted to come today because they don't want to be convicted about their sin." But I feel called by God anyways to start a church in my village. And so he was there. That's what we were doing that day. We were doing a church planting meeting. He was going to start right away planting this church. And so uh, the service goes on and um, I had prepared a message just in case. And uh, they said, okay, now you're up. And they just pointed at me like, it's your turn, right? The whole service was in Spanish before this. And then I get up. And I'm, I'm giving a sermon, and so I get to give a sermon on Isaiah chapter 6, and where we learn that God is holy, holy, holy. And uh, at the end of that, it says, here I am, Lord, send me. And I was talking to Miguel, and I was talking to these pastors, and I thought the whole time, who am I, Right? Like, who am I to be here in this time, in this place with what God is doing with these people? It was just so humbling and awesome to see that God is alive and well all over the world, not just here in Green Bay, not just in the United States, but he's there in Peru. He's working. He's building his church among the Yanisha people. And so uh, it was just a really neat experience. And uh, that's a plug as well, because I want to invite you to come to Peru with us. Hopefully we're going to take a trip again next summer. And uh, we need people. We're, we can take up to like 18 people on these trips to Peru. And so we'd love for you to experience short-term missions, uh, not as an adventure, but in order for our church to learn what it means to take the gospel and to go out into the world and preach it to people who need to hear it. And so if you're interested at all, I would love to talk to you about that. Um, It can be as basic as you can pick up a cinder block from this point and move it over there. That can be how simple this mission trip is for you. Otherwise, um, you could do some teaching English. Did you know that the fact that you speak conversational English is a tool that you can use for evangelism in Peru? So... Um, I'd love to talk to you more about that. Hopefully we'll have a celebration here soon about uh, all of our missions trips this summer. Well, if I didn't mention it already, my name is Bill, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Spring Lake Church. We've been in this Crowns series, uh, and if you've been here, you know that we're looking at the kings of the Bible. And so we're going to continue that today, but we're going to actually be looking at a pretty unique king of the Bible today because we're going to be looking at the first king of Israel. His name is King Saul. You see, Israel's history is actually uh, pretty fascinating because all the people groups around Israel at this time had kings. They had a centralized governing authority under a king, and Israel was a little bit different. You see, Israel was just a band of tribes with no real central governing authority. Their only real authority figures were like the prophets or the judges at the time, but those judges, for instance, only had temporary powers, 
So imagine the, you know, Israel's being attacked, the, the Hebrews are being attacked by nations around it. What the judges would do is they would uh, call the tribes together and they would gather and muster an army and they'd fight. And then guess what happened? Right after that battle was over, the army disbanded because the judge really wasn't in charge of the nation. He was just kind of leading as a figure at certain points. And so there was leaders, there was uh, prophets, there was elders, there was people that helped govern, but it was actually supposed to be God himself who was king over Israel before Saul. God was supposed to be the supreme leader. Israel was supposed to be different than the nations surrounding it. And so Saul's actually quite unique in that he becomes the first king over all the tribes of Israel. Now, right away, what you need to know about Saul is that Saul was a king who actually fit the part really well, at least on how he looked. Uh, We find this in 1 Samuel. In fact, 1 Samuel is the book of the Bible that talks the most about King Saul. And so if you want to know things about King Saul, you should read 1 Samuel. But 1 Samuel 9, 2 says this, And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So he was a tall, handsome guy. And it's thought that this phrase, head and shoulders above the rest, actually entered into language because of this biblical description of Saul. But the point is, Saul was the most handsome and the tallest of all of the Israelites. When Saul went to his mirror and he said, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? The mirror would say, you are Saul, right? Right? Because he was the most handsome of all of the people. And he's kind of like, you can get this picture in your mind, he's kind of like the stud high school quarterback that's like super athletic and everyone really wants to be like him. And and based on that description, you might think that King Saul is going to be this great leader. He's going to be this awesome king. And yet what we find throughout the book of 1 Samuel is many examples of how King Saul actually fails to live up to his potential. In fact, it may be accurate to say that King Saul is a case study in how not to lead a nation because he messes up a lot. But what I find really interesting about Saul's story is actually what we can learn from his life and his leadership. There's many, many stories of Saul's life that can teach us great lessons. In fact, We're going to see actually some different lessons than we've seen from some of the other kings of the Bible. And I want to zoom in today on three lessons from King Saul's life that we need for today. But before we jump into scripture, will you just go to God with with me in prayer? Lord, um, we come to you. And first, we just pause for a second. We pause because we want to recognize that you are king. Yes, there's leaders of our nation. There's leaders throughout the world. But you are king. You are sovereign over all. And Lord, I pray that um, we would be people who have King Jesus who, are, who is sitting on the throne of our hearts. And Lord, we pray today, Lord, that um, because of your sovereignty over our lives, that we would be open to hearing what your word says, that we'd be open to changing, that we'd be open to growing, that we'd be open to the Holy Spirit working and moving in each of our lives. Lord, we pray that you would do your work in us, that you would give us ears to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first lesson that we can learn from Saul's life is never place human leaders in God's rightful place. Now, as I said, we're going to be in 1 Samuel a lot. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you have a phone or something uh, that can get you to the Bible, we'd love for you to turn there. Otherwise, it'll be on the screen. We're going to be looking at really three distinct stories. But the first one is in 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 18. This is what it says. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you are old. That's not very nice, right? 
But anyways, they say to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint us a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not that they have rejected, it's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know that the king who will reign over them will claim them as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. And he said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve his chariots and horses. And they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and some commanders of fifties. And others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and olive groves. And he will give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you, will re- you yourself will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out from the king you have chosen. Or you cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. And so it's not specifically about King Saul as much as it is about what really leads up to him becoming the first king. You see, the nation of Israel is looking at all the nations around it and it's going, man, we wish we had a strong authority. We wish we had a king who could unite the people together. And and of course, they wouldn't put it into these terms. But what we understand from this passage is what's happening is that Israel is actually rejecting God's leadership of the nation. They feel like their nation at this point should be better managed. That maybe it should be more comparable to the nations around it. And to be clear, on one hand, they might be right. But what they get dead wrong is the source of their problem. Because instead of understanding that the nation is struggling because of the rejection of God's leadership, they assume that the problem is God's leadership itself. And so they ask Samuel for a human king to lead them instead. They want to put a human leader in God's rightful place of authority. Now, you heard in the passage the warning that was given to them. Uh, Samuel says to them that the king who will reign over them will claim all of these rights. He will take their sons. He will uh, take their daughters to be perfumers. He will take the best of their fields. He will take their tenth of their flocks that they themselves will become slaves. And the idea here is that the people of Israel are going to give part of their own sovereignty and dignity and autonomy as they follow God as their king. And they're going to transfer it over to a human king who will take and take and take from them. They're moving from God, who has their best in mind, to a human king who has his best in mind. And if you've been paying attention this whole crown series, you'll know how well this works out for the nation of Israel. Right? There was very few kings who actually did right in the eyes of the Lord and led the nations well. Otherwise, it was just a big mess. It was a terrible for the nation. And I have to say that this is such an important lesson for the church in 2021. Whether it's a political leader or a church leader, you and I should never give a person God's rightful place of authority in our lives. I'm just going to be really honest and tell you that this last political season was a pretty scary time for the church. And the reason why it was scary for me is because I looked out and I saw many Christians begin to shift their ultimate hope from God and his kingdom to political outcomes and earthly kingdoms. 
And to, to be really clear, this happens on both sides of the aisle, but the point is this, never get so wrapped up in an earthly leader or a party that you forget that there is a king and there is a kingdom that supersedes all of this. Nations and leaders will rise and fall, but it is God who is our king and our ultimate hope. No matter what happens to this nation we belong to right now, our ultimate allegiance is to King Jesus. What does that mean for us practically? Well, it means that when an earthly leader begins to redefine what is good and evil, that you and I actively reject that for what God says is good and evil. It means that we don't let our values and what's important to us be shaped by a person in a political moment, but we get those things from God's word. It means that when we face consequences for following God's truth over man's laws, we still move forward because honoring God is more important than honoring man. We should never place human leaders in God's rightful place of authority. We should never confuse a person's leadership with God's leadership. Those two things are very different. They're not the same thing. Every person on this earth is capable of great evil and leading us astray. And so we have to fix our eyes on our sole authority, who is God, our King. And we have to check anything that a human being does against the authority of God's word. Let's take a look at the second lesson from King Saul. Trust God's path and plan all the way to the end. Okay, so we're going to zoom forward a little bit. Here's another story about um, King Saul, 1 Samuel 13, 1 through 15. So what happened, Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Geba and Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes, and Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. And then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Haven. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in the caves, in the thickets, among the rocks, and in the pits, and in the cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed over to the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. And so he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. And so I I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Geba in Benjamin, and Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered about 600. Okay, so we're zooming in on one of Saul's major failures before the Lord. I don't know if you caught all of this in one reading, but the scenario is that Israel has been and is in this battle with the Philistines, right? Philistines are a people group who are close to them and they're constantly battling. And so there's been these different skirmishes and battles. They're in constant conflict. And Jonathan, who is Saul's son, goes up and he attacks this outpost. 
And what happens is the Philistines get really angry. It sends them into a frenzy. And they amass this huge army to come and defeat Israel. But the problem is, is that Samuel has told Saul that he must wait for him. He must wait for him for seven whole days. And presumably, when Samuel arrives, he'll function as the priest and he'll offer sacrifices to God and he'll seek God's favor in this conflict with the Philistines. But while Saul and his army are waiting and hiding from the Philistines, what happens? But they begin to be fearful. Men begin to abandon the army. And so when seven days rolls around and Samuel isn't there right away, Saul takes matters into his own hands. And he acts as the priest and he does the sacrifices himself. And did you catch it? What happens right after Saul is done? Who shows up? Samuel does, doesn't he? Now, there's certainly multiple problems with Saul's actions here. For instance, Saul is a Benjamite. He's not a Levite. And if you remember anything about the Old Testament tribes, the Levites were the only ones who were really allowed to be priests and to actually do the sacrifices. And so as a Benjamite, uh, Saul was uh, violating God's law by doing the sacrifices. But what was really at the core of Saul's mistake? You know, I think it really comes down to that under pressure, when it really came down to it, when fear set in, instead of trusting God in his way, Saul ends up trusting his own ability to get things done. Saul trusts himself. And it may be easy for us to stand back and stand in judgment over Saul and be like, man, that guy blew it. What a bonehead, right? Maybe easy for us to think that we would do better in that process. We look at it um, through those, those lenses that we would do much better. But the truth is, we do this all the time. We take things that God has in his hands, that God has in his timing, and we try to force them to happen sooner. We trust ourselves rather than trusting God. You know, Erica and I just experienced this in the house buying process. The market is insane right now. The housing market is crazy. I don't know if you've heard that. I said that in a sermon a few months ago. Um, and it has been crazy. Like, lo- like you go to buy a house and you lose like seven, eight, nine, ten offers. Right? You put, a- put all, your, all your chips in a basket and put it on the table. And then they come back and they're like, no, someone bought it for $50,000 more than you put down. You're like, what? Who are these people? Where are they getting this money? Right? And so we're in the middle of this process and the market has been so crazy and people are over leveraging themselves with these offers and they're paying way more than a house is worth. And sometimes people are are doing more than they can afford just to get into a house. And just to be really candid with you, Erica and I uh, were tempted really to do the same thing. In fact, as time went by and we lost offer after offer, fear started creeping into our hearts and we kept thinking that maybe we'll just have to like go beyond our budget. Like maybe we'll just have to like do something unwise just to get into a house, right? And I'm thankful that the Lord protected us. I'm thankful that some of those offers fell through, to be honest with you, because God really provided for us in the end and we got a great house and God protected us, but it could have gone the other way because we were trusting ourselves, because we were trusting fear over God's path and his plan. You see, when you're not in a stressful situation, it can be really easy to look and say, you know what, I'll trust God all the way to the end. When we sold our house, you know, like we put it up on the market and that weekend it sold, we're like, trusting God is great. You know, like, this is awesome. Like, God, God provided. This is amazing. And then we got into the situation we were, and it was really difficult. Fear set in, and it was so difficult to trust God all the way to the end. When you're in the midst of something like that, it can be easy to justify all sorts of things to get what you think you need in the moment. And that was the essence of, of Saul's mistake and a great reminder for each of us. You know, we're not just called to trust God conceptually when things are pretty good, pretty easy. We're called to trust God's path and plan all the way to the end. Think about it. The seventh day came, but because Samuel didn't show up right away in the morning, Saul took matters into his own hands and he trusted himself. But what would have happened? 
What would have happened if he would have just waited a little bit longer because just a matter of a couple hours later, Samuel would have been there. In the time lapse of just a couple hours, Saul threw away his favor from God and his legacy of his kingdom. Samuel even says, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, if you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. Ugh, that's a gut punch, isn't it? You know, it makes me wonder what sort of things we miss out on because we're not willing to wait and trust God all the way to the end. You know, maybe today you're facing something like that. Maybe today you have something where you know God's got it, but you're tempted to force it. I prayed for you this week. I prayed for you the week before that God would give you endurance, that God would use his Holy Spirit in your life to help you to trust him even when fear sets in. Because you know, one of the things I learned about buying a house is God's got it. Ultimately, in the end, it's God who's got it. It's the one, he is the one in control and we have to wait on him and trust on him to the very end. Let's take a look at the next lesson. Lesson number three, keep in mind partial obedience is disobedience. So here's another story from Saul's life. First Samuel 15, one through nine, it says this. Uh, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. And so listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare do not spare them. Put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. And so Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Talim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and uh, set an ambush in the ravine. And he said to the Canaanites, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. And so the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. And then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way to uh, Havilah, to Shear, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he did, totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and his army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. You know, first I want to say that this story seems pretty savage at first. Like lots of people have struggled with this idea that God would command such destruction of people. We don't have really a lot of time to go in depth about that, but I'll remind you that there's a reason why God commands what he does. He's executing judgment on the Amalekites because the Amalekites were a really evil group of people. In fact, what they did was when Israel was coming out of Egypt, they actually waited for the, the band of the Israelites to go through and then they waited for all those stragglers. You know, you ever been in a group with a whole bunch of people? You have like the little kids who are like toddling behind and you have the older people who can't walk as fast and you have people who are carrying heavy burdens and they can't go as quickly. Uh, the Amalekites waited for the most vulnerable of the Israelites and then they picked them off and they killed them. And so God was executing his judgment on these people. They were evil so God commands their utter destruction, but what we just heard is what Saul actually did. He destroyed everyone, he destroyed everything, except he doesn't destroy the king. And any sort of livestock or bounty that was in good shape, he also doesn't destroy. Now, if you keep on reading, you'll see that Samuel actually confronts Saul about this, and Saul's excuse is that oh, I just wanted to keep those things, the best of the cattle, the best lambs, the best all of this, so that I could sacrifice them to God. To which we should all say, yeah, right, right? In fact, let's say that because that's how I feel about this, right? Ready? On three, we're gonna say, yeah, right. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah, right, okay? 
basically what Saul is doing is that he's just making an excuse. In his partial, he's making an excuse to justify his partial obedience by saying that his intentions were in the right place. But when you look back in the story, if you were to read the whole thing again, you would see that it doesn't hold any water. And Saul makes a mistake that many of us make. It's believing that partial obedience is the same thing as full obedience. And it just doesn't work that way. When it comes to partial obedience, partial obedience is disobedience. And this can be a really hard lesson for us to learn, especially as followers of Jesus, because partial obedience is a whole lot easier than total obedience, right? It's actually kind of easy to be partially obedient. In fact, I would say that this is one of the biggest ways that you and I begin to justify our sin. And I just want you to think about this for a second. Think about it with purity. Well, I know we're not married and we did everything we could do intimately, but at least we didn't actually have sex, partial obedience. Or, you know, 99% of the year, I don't drink until I'm drunk. But the 4th of July, the 4th of July is when I let loose, and that's my fun time during the year. And I get hammered, right? Partial obedience. Or um, I'm mostly honest with my taxes. Like, I'm probably 95%. There's just 5% that's not exactly true. Listen, no matter what it is, partial obedience is disobedience. And that can be really heavy. Like, we're all kind of like, oh, shoot, right? Thought I was doing okay. Thought I was doing okay until I started to understand that partial obedience is disobedience. But the more and more you think about this truth, the more and more you should be thankful for God's amazing grace in Christ Jesus. Because think about this for a second. It was Jesus who lived the fully obedient life to his father. It was Jesus. He was the only one who could. Jesus was never partially obedient. Jesus was always fully obedient to the father. And it was Jesus who lived the fully obedient life that you and I could not live. And it was Jesus who took on our disobedience, our partial obedience, and he nailed it to the cross. It was Jesus who conquered our sin and our death so that you and I could have new life. That new life we get in him is a call to pursue a life of total obedience and to trust him when we fail. You know, when we're convicted of our sin, our tendency often is to go into the darkness, to go into the shame, to try to hide it, to try to cover it up. That's our tendency. That's, that's what we want to do. And, and so a lot of people, when they are confronted with their sin, they wrestle in their hearts with that sin. They, they don't want to confess it before God. They don't want anyone to know about it. But our call in Christ Jesus is a lifestyle of repentance because hiding it doesn't do anything. Hiding it makes it worse. We have to bring our sin, our partial obedience to Jesus. Our call is to turn to Jesus, to confess your sin and to ask him to help you live the life that you're called to live in him. And so I want to close with this. I want to challenge you with one takeaway. You know, there's many lessons from Saul's life. There's more lessons than I can give. There's actually a whole other point that I'm not even going to bring up, but you could actually go on YouTube and find last week's message and hear the fourth point if you really want to. But there's all these lessons from never placing people in God's rightful place of authority to trusting God's path and plan all the way to the end. But maybe today, the one that most of us need to hear is that partial obedience is actually disobedience. You see, in just a minute, we're going to celebrate communion. And communion is actually a reflection and a proclamation of what Jesus accomplished for us through his death. As we prepare for communion, I just encourage you to use this time to search your heart. 
to see if there's anything in you that violates God's law, either fully or partially, and confess it. If there are any areas in your life right now where you're being partially obedient to Jesus, I would suggest that you need to give those things to Jesus. Admit it and ask that he would help you move your heart and actions towards complete obedience to him. God, uh, partial obedience, ooh, that's hard. It's easy to think, I'm not doing any of the major things wrong. Uh, I'm not doing any of the huge sins that you really care about. We kind of start to justify that in our hearts. And yet when we consider that partial obedience is disobedience, Lord, a lot of us feel the shame. A lot of us feel the guilt. And yet, Lord, you don't call us to remain there. In fact, that shame, that guilt, the the things, the feelings that come up when we think about our partial obedience should lead us back to Jesus. Lord, we are so thankful that King Jesus is the one who was totally obedient on our behalf before God the Father. That you live the perfect life that we could not live. And so Lord, I pray that you would help us to look to you. Lord, that in the end, it would really be about trusting our Savior Jesus.